Good evening, folks. Welcome to our weekly check-in for the home cutting garden. I'm so glad you've joined me here today, and we are talking about the little three by 10 cutting garden that um, is so easy to install in your own backyard to have a couple of big old bunches, a handful of flowers each and every week. So we've been checking in each week building the bed and planting it and we're going to talk i'm going to recap kind of where we are and look at what we um where we are now and what's to come so this is i got dirt all over this is the seed collection we're talking about and it comes with the little diagram on the back that shows you um, exactly the layout you should plant um, because one thing that i find a lot of people that are perhaps gardeners that um, aren't used to growing a cutting garden find is that we plant cutting gardens so much closer together, right? So that's why we just went one step further and actually put the diagram on here because if you really think about it, when you harvest a cutting garden, and that's what we're gonna kind of talk about tonight. Uh, when you harvest a cutting garden, it's like giving it a, a heavy duty haircut, pruning like twice a week. And so the spacing is really, really a glitch that a lot of people get stuck on. And that's why we can fit so very, very much um, into such a small space. And I don't think I have told y'all this story that um, back, golly day, it must have been probably 15 years ago when Suzanne and I first came up with a cutting garden seed collection. Um, my first inclination, because even I thought that a three by 10 bed just couldn't produce enough flowers, right? So we actually planted, we actually designed it at first to have two three by 10 beds. And I can still remember as clear as day. She, we had already harvested the farm flowers, so we were dead meat, right? And we went to this little display demo garden that we had planted for photography. And um, so we were out there cutting. She was cutting one and I was cutting the other. They were right there side by side. And I can just remember her looking up at me, I mean, just drenched with sweat with her big old hat on and said, who in their right mind would need two of these three by 10 gardens? Nobody needs this many flowers. And it was like high July and those little gardens pumped out almost a full bucket from each little bed at that time of the year. So don't let the three by 10 size think you're not gonna have a lot of great flowers. So I just wanna recap where we've come from and where we are today. First off, the sun is, see it's still in the building. Wait till I show you guys those. We are in, we have really finally started into high sunflower season here. So I have some gorgeous sunflowers to show you this evening. Um, but it's cold, I took a coat off. Um, yeah, some cute bunny hopping behind you. There are so many rabbits on this farm. I actually have to walk Tucker with a leash anytime at dusk and later because there are so many rabbits that he just tears all over the place. Um, so this little cutting garden, um, the seed collection can be planted direct seeded and we're actually normally heading into that time of the year that you could direct seed these outside. Um, what I was gonna say was I almost, I had a coat on before I started this. And then when I was walking through the sun, I thought, what am I doing with the sun with the coat on? So I took it off, but it is even a tad bit chilly. So unusual for this late in May um, here. We're usually just overheated already at this point. So the little cutting garden can be started from transplants or from seed. To recap what we've done, I believe this is the fourth or the fifth week. Because it's been like such a strange season, I can't even really remember which week this is. But the beds, I instead of having one long three, 10 foot by three foot bed, I cut ours in half. So I actually have, and you'll see this in just a minute, I actually have two three by five foot beds because that just perfectly frames um, the front of this building, which you'll see in a minute. We're trying to recreate um, 
those photos from years ago that just became such um, hot topics on magazines and on front it was on the cover of two books um, of just how sweet this little cutting garden can be so where I built these beds was just grass just a few weeks ago and I decided to do this and so I put down so I did not spray anything I didn't dig anything well, all I did was I had a two large sheets of, ply, of um, cardboard, really big sheets. They were like four by eight sheets that came with um, some product that we buy. So I just cut it to the three by five size, put it down on the grass. Um, you'll see that I put rocks around the edge of my little garden, which has actually held that cardboard down. And then we just filled it up. I collected all those containers that you have sitting around your home outside or on your farm that you're not going to plant this year you're not going to use we just dumped all of that soil into these beds and then we added a little bit addition to this um, we added some potting soil and compost about a 50 50 mix and then i did add in our crab and lobster fertilizer which you can find all these things that you're going to hear me talk about at the gardeners workshop.com um, that is our website where we offer just the seeds and tools that I actually use here in my garden and on my farm so I did mix in the crab and lobster fertilizer and um, and then I planted transplants and so um, they haven't grown quite it's just so funny we have only I could bet I can only count on one hand how many really warm days we have had I mean like over 80 degrees when we have a day like that these things just grow so much in a day but on these cooler days like today's a cool day um, they just kind of sit there and they just don't do a lot of top growth so we're kind of lagging behind and if you direct seeded this garden earlier and you've been having cool temperatures it is pretty likely that your seeds may not even have germinated yet and when you plant seeds into conditions that aren't conducive to them to germinate quickly then stuff happens to your seeds sometimes they rot from all the rain and cool temperatures birds get them um, and there's just a whole lot of um, things that can happen to a seed that's why you only want to ever direct seed anything at any time that prefers that method when the conditions are right for it because you want it to sprout really really quick right so we are gonna look at our little garden in a minute last week I showed how to use the hand hoe weeding and I did one of the beds well I didn't weed the other bed yet because now the weed the weeds were so tiny last week I think that was a little hard to actually see them so this week they're bigger they're still definitely small enough to be easily taken out so I'm gonna show you how um, we hoe I mean it would take if I didn't have to hold the phone and balance all that stuff it wouldn't take me three minutes to thoroughly weed these two beds and be done with it because my transplants aren't quite big enough yet we have not mulched yet I'm hoping I said this last week I was hoping that this week I'd be mulching but some of the transplants I'm just looking I just like for my transplants to be about five inches tall before they get mulch if the transplants had been larger when I planted them which is a whole story in itself you can go back previous weeks um, sessions and watch that um, I would have actually mulched first then planted into the mulch so you know different times and you just sometimes have to really tweak what you do for the conditions I mean yes there's definitely craziness going on but the reality is that every year is different I can look back through 22 years of garden journaling and tell you that every spring every summer every fall I'll say it's crazy this happened or that happened so you really a big part of being a commercial farmer is um, being flexible and reading the conditions to plant accordingly to do that and you just do the very um, best that you can now um, 
I just have some little things here on my list that I just want to be sure to mention to you. So we, I just told you how we built the beds and I added the fertilizer and then we planted our transplants. And we're kind of in between, I have a list of build, fertilize, plant, mulch, and then net. We haven't mulched and we haven't netted yet, right? So we're kind of in between planting and mulching. And I wanted to just say this, because um, I get this question often. Um, it would be really great if you wanted to use liquid um, fertilizer. We love the Neptune's Harvest seaweed and fish. That's what we use for our seedlings when they're growing indoors. And we put that through our irrigation tape and I actually put it in a watering can and sprinkle it onto our plants. That's what's called foliar feeding. However, I do not feed zinnias after other than what's in the soil when we prepare it. Um, fertilizer can help, fertilizer, that's a whole talk in itself, fertilizer can ignite a lot of problems if you use it too much. Um, you know, you can get aphids because of all the new tender growth, but fertilizer can actually help fuel mildew in zinnias. It doesn't give them mildew. But if it's, and it's, pre, it's on all zinnias, all zinnias are predisposed to that. So I do not liquid fertilize my zinnias after they're planted in the garden. What's in our soil, what we put in there when we prepared is plenty enough. So before we get up and start walking around, and if the sun cooperates, I promised someone um, this morning, I did a little quick video, a little quick Facebook Live in my um, closed flower farming school online group, took them through the cool flower garden because the light was perfect um, to update them on some things that I'm seeing. And I didn't see that somebody asked to look at my tunnel. And if you don't know what that is, you'll be really excited to see it. We have a 32 foot garden tunnel that was just planted. And if the light will cooperate, we'll walk over there um, and to have a look at that. So what I wanna talk about today is, let me grab the sunflowers. I wanna talk about harvesting and conditioning flowers. And um, actually I'm gonna move over here to the steps so we can just sit next to these flowers. The sun has moved now, let's see, which one? Oh, I'll sit right here. This is much easier. So y'all, look at these sunflowers. Oh, I'm just gonna have to pick them up. Now I have to find a flat spot. All right, so Suzanne's in making bouquets for my deliveries tomorrow, but look at these sunflowers. This is the Pro Cut Orange. I mean, the camera doesn't do justice, y'all. I just can't even tell you how spectacular what I want you to notice is the size, these are like a perfect bouquet size. So they're like the size of the palm of my hand. This is the absolutely perfect, um, the perfect bouquet size, or even this would be gorgeous sitting on somebody's um, kitchen table. And so this is the sunflower that actually comes in the Cutting Garden Seed Collection. That's um, Pro Cut Orange, which is right there. And I'm not gonna give you the details of it because you can um, find it in a lot of places on our website. You control the size of your sunflower heads. These were planted with the, the same spacing that's on the Cutting Garden Collection that shows you in the diagram. But if you spaced these like 12 inches apart in all directions, they'd be huge. So sunflower head size is typically controlled by spacing in the garden. And so I mentioned when I planted this garden that um, I swapped out and didn't plant orange out here. I actually planted the white sunflowers. Y'all look at that. They are, this is the, um, Let's see, today is Sunday. So Thursday was my first cut of sunflowers. And now we have five buckets, which translate into about 600 sunflowers um, that was harvested yesterday. So see, there's some that are dark. This is called white night. And this is white light. And I've said many, and they're pro cuts. They're the same family as the orange ones. And I've said many times that 
you know, I'm not the biggest fan of them, but I'm telling you, they're growing on me. They're our customers, number one. They just absolutely love them. Um, they're the same, easy to grow, same, follow all the same um, growing conditions and spacing as the orange ones. And this harvester full of these babies are just absolutely beautiful. Look at that. That's two bunches. So... I wanted to just share those with you. And you cut them, I'm just looking, I don't have one in here that's, these are all open, these were all cut yesterday. Um, you cut them when they're pretty much closed and they quickly open um, once you get them harvested. So what I wanna talk about today, I gotta rearrange this, I'm about to knock it off. Um, what I wanted to talk about today is cut flower harvesting um, and just some general tips and some practices that we basically follow here on the farm. And, you know, it's just, it's so simple that I find that a lot of people just don't do it. They don't follow it. And I'll go back and look at your questions um, here shortly. Um, so I'm just thinking to myself, we have this wooden sign that I did hold up and share, I think on the first or second um, week of our home cutting garden. You know, a, a, a no brainer, but a lot of people just really don't realize it. You would never leave flat I, a half gallon of ice cream in the car, a hot car, right? You know, you wouldn't go and pick up groceries with ice cream and then stop, make two stops on the way home. You need to think of flowers just like ice cream. If you're picking them up from the farmer's market or wherever you buy flowers from, they need to be put in water immediately. A lot of our, our dedicated flower customers have buckets in their cars all the time. We give them water. And um, so that is something that a lot of people actually damage their flowers so severely just bringing them home that they never really recover, really dependent on what they go through. I mean, I just, I could tell you stories that I just want to say, I mean, do you not think about it? They live in water. It's a live thing. Um, and so you would just never leave them. Um, using a clean container. Now, you know, we love this flower harvester and we use actually five gallon buckets here on our farm. I'm going to take these out for a minute. This is our flower caddy. And it has three holes and it's got a handle and I just can't tell you how blooming convenient it is. Um, it is super convenient for the home gardener or the small grower because the holes are so small. You know, we use five gallon buckets because we harvest more than a bucket of the same crop typically twice a week. And so we don't have a problem with mixing blooms up in a bucket, which can often crush and damage them, or um, they slide down on the side because you don't have enough flowers in the bucket to really hold it up. So we prefer to use plastic, whatever you use, it should be plastic like this, or a bucket, um, because flower conditioning products um, can interact with metal. You don't ever wanna use a metal can with flower conditioning products. It's like a bad science project. It'll slowly kill your flowers. Um, it's a chemical reaction, actually. You know, I'm just having a terrible time here today. Um, so we only use plastic. I mean, when I first started going to the farmer's markets years ago, I mean, you wanna look so cool and, you know, French or English or whatever, and so you carry all these extra containers. I look on Facebook at some of the beautiful photos that new farmers are, print, are showing of all the stuff um, that they're hauling to farmer's markets, which of course isn't a real problem right now. Many of them aren't even able to sell at farmer's markets, but we quickly got over that. I mean, we took 40 buckets, 40 five gallon buckets of flowers to market each time. So there we found ways of not using special containers. We just used plastic buckets. They were beautiful and coordinated and um, that way we can use flower conditioning products in them without worrying about it. Um, so plastic buckets or plastic containers are really easy to keep clean. If you're not willing to drink water out of whatever you're using to cut your flowers into or from your vases, then you shouldn't be putting flowers in them. 
And I'll tell you here in just a nutshell, um, you can learn more about this. There are a couple of blogs on our website um, on my that I've written, Making Your Cut Flowers Last Longer. There's a lot of um, information on our website. And like, I think you can just go to the products on the store, Fresh Flower Food, and it'll link you to all of those. Um, but the number one thing you can do for your flowers, whether you're cutting them in your backyard or bringing them home from somewhere, is to wash your containers. If you're not willing to drink out of it, you shouldn't be putting flowers in it. And here's why I'll tell you how that all happens. So I'm not talking about you look in it and it looks clean to you. It's not dirt that I'm talking about because most of us are smart enough to figure that out. But it is the water scum residue that's left from the last time it was used. And because I tell you, and I mean, I've been guilty of it. How many times have I had a big, beautiful vase or something that the flowers are gone from it and it sits on my counter waiting to be hand washed? Um, you know, you're running in and out from the farm all day and you just set it aside. I have rabbits coming on. I could come on screen with me now. There's three of them right there. Crazy. Um, and yeah, I didn't wash it. You just dump the water out and the next thing you know, you're just setting it back into the cabinet and it never got washed. That's what I'm talking about. And we have a bucket washing station on this farm. When my building was built, um, we put a double outdoor big sink and it's we are set up to wash buckets because it is that darn important. The scum, I mean, I don't know if you've ever looked at a glass of water that's sat around for three or four days. It is yuck-o. It grows all kinds of gooky stuff. And so when you pour it out, that stuff is in there. And in there included is bacteria. And when that bucket sits, that stuff doesn't just disappear. The minute that water gets added back in, you instantly have bacteria. And that means those fresh new flowers that you've just brought home, it's like you're putting them into four-day-old water. And you can put flower products in that, and it may help a little, but you're defeating the whole purpose. Clean container is the best thing you can do for your flowers. We wash vases in the dishwasher. We put flower frogs in the dishwasher. Um, and if you don't, if it's too big for your dishwasher, then you need to hand wash it with soap and water and get down into the crevices because that's where the really yucky stuff is. So clean containers. Um, we like to harvest either in the morning or at this time of night. And in fact, there's pros and cons to both times. Um, the, the argument for late in the day cutting is that the flowers have had all day to take up carbohydrates and there's more stored in the stem. And it's been said that zinnias are better cut in the evening. I mean, I can tell you this, after me working on the farm all day, I'm not cutting flowers at night. Um, we've never done it. Um, and um, so I don't know that somebody needs to specially do that, but I'm saying this because there are a lot of people that are, have, you know, nine to five jobs that want to have a cutting garden and it is perfectly acceptable to cut your cutting garden late in the day. And when I talk late in the day, <clears throat> I'm talking about the hour before sunset. Um, so that would be the best time once the heat of the day is gone and the flowers aren't stressed. Um, we prefer to cut in the morning. That's when the flowers have recovered overnight from the heat and are refreshed, particularly hydrangeas and those types of things. And um, we use flower conditioning products and I did not bring them out here with me, I'm sorry y'all. Um, you can find everything I'm talking about at thegardenersworkshop.com, go to supplies, and we sell, I'm gonna tell you how to use them, we sell the 50 packs of fresh cut flower food and the 50 count tablets, these rabbits, they are pretty, hope y'all are having fun. <laughs> um, the um, CVBN tablets, which are actually chlorine tablets, they used to be named Gerber tabs because they were developed for the use with Gerber daisies because they suffer the most from bacteria, um, but a lot of our garden flowers do. So this is how we do it here and um, this is how it's very simplified for us. So we use the CVBN tablets. Those tablets, by putting them in your harvest water, and it smells just like a swimming pool, when you put a tablet into your harvest water and the directions are on them of how much water, a gallon to a pill, that means the first drink of water that that stem gets is all bacteria-free. It's getting this 
totally clean water up in the stem that buys you a couple of days. Those flowers can sit in that chlorine for up to three days, 72 hours. Is that three days? That is three days. They can sit in there for three days. There is no food involved in that. There's no nutrition. That is purely a biocide that cleans the water. So for us on the farm here, we put a pill in every harvest bucket, whether a flower thinks it needs it or not, everybody gets one. They're harvested. They need to sit in that for, for the benefit for at least four hours, but you can leave it sitting, the flowers sitting in it for up to three days to give you wiggle room. So we then, they sit overnight and then Suzanne either makes them into bouquets and they go home with our customer with the fresh flower food packet, which is what the end user uses. Flower farmers do not use this. Home gardeners and flower farmers that are sending home the packets with their customers, which you should be doing, um, is food. Food has in it a nutrition, it keeps the leaves and the foliage green, keeps buds opening. It has a pH balancer in it. And what that does for the pH, um, you know how rose heads nod and go down? That typically comes from air bubbles in the stems. When the pH is off in the water in a stem, that's what happens. So it has a pH balancer in it. And then it has a bio side to continue what the GERB tab or the CVBN tab has started so it keeps killing bacteria and I will tell you that by using a clean container and using a chlorine tablet you've bought yourself a couple three days extra vase life just from doing that then by harvesting at the right stage which we'll be looking at that over the coming weeks um, harvesting at the right stage not letting your flowers lay out of water not leaving them in a hot car if you're buying them at the farmers market all the little steps that you do just add more and more vase life. And then the other thing is once the home user gets them, or if that's you, if you're a home gardener, so you cut your flowers into CVB tablet, you let them sit overnight, the next day you make yourself a little arrangement, you put flower food, you just get rid of the bleach, um, the um, chlorine water. It's only stable for 72 hours. It's not any good after that. You harvest your flowers into CVB, let them sit overnight. The next morning, you make your little arrangement. Then you put a packet of flower food into your vase. Then what I recommend and think does a really great job in about three or four days, I pull my flowers out of the vase, not letting go of them so you don't mess your arrangement up. And <clears throat> we dump the vase, swish it around. If it's ooky, wash it. But if not, just swish it, dump it, refill it cut about an inch off your stems. I just fill it with water, no flower food at this point in time, and put me, how long do you want your flowers to last? I mean, 10 days is like plenty long enough, right? Um, and then put your flowers back in. Flowers rot from the bottom of the stem up. So by keeping the container clean and snipping off that little debris at the end of the stem, um, makes the flowers last a really, really, really long time. And um, I think that's all I wanted to tell you about flower conditionings. I didn't bring my snips out here either. Um, you, you always use what are called bypass shears, and you'll see them um, on another um, week. That bypass means they don't smash. There is no use for a smashing cutter anymore. They realize now that you should never use that for anything. So it's just like a pair of scissors. The blades bypass one another. Um, I have not wiped off my clippers in 22 years, and I'm not jiving you there. Um, it's a different story if you're working on import flowers maybe, but in your garden, I have never had a disease problem. Um, I've just never had it. Now the rabbits are coming on the other side, y'all. Nice seeing you. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to get you thinking about. Flower food makes an enormous difference. And I will tell you quickly, what time is it? Why people think flower food doesn't work, okay? So when I say flowers that have gone through the retail cycle, I'm talking about flowers that are grown in South America, um, put in a box, never any water, stripped it, put into a stripped down 747, flown into Miami, auctioned off to a 
wholesaler to a bouquet making business it is still not in not in water <clears throat> it is then shipped to the buyer who then prepares it for whatever market it's going into if it's it going to a florist or is it <clears throat> going to be made into the bouquets that you see in supermarkets then it has to be gotten to the supermarket or gotten to the florist and then it's either sold to you or the florist makes a bunch of uh, makes an arrangement and sells it that is a really long time those are flowers that have gone through what I call the retail cycle <clears throat> if you ask the flower you might say it's a torture cycle really um, but what happens is those stems are totally clogged. I mean, you can imagine the bottom couple of inches is dry as a bone, right? So <clears throat> those flowers typically have clogged stems. And if you don't take the steps of rehydrating them properly to get them drinking, then they don't drink. So this is what happens. You buy a bunch of flowers in the supermarket. They have the little packet attached to the rubber band. You bring them home, you put the packet of food in the vase, you stick the flowers in, and they last a week. Next week, you buy another bunch of flowers from the supermarket, but this week, there's no flower food attached. So you take it home, you put them in water, and it lasts about a week, and you say to yourself, shoot, food doesn't really make any difference, you know? Well, here's why it doesn't make any difference to those flowers, because those stems are not drinking. If your vase is not being pretty much sucked dry in two or three days, your stems are not drinking. Supermarket bouquets that have those clogged stems from being going through that long retail cycle aren't drinking. But if somebody took them home and cut about four inches off of them, then put them in to water with food, they would drink. So that's why flower food has really gotten a bad rap. It's not the flower food, it's the process those flowers have gone through. So I spend a lot of extra income, um, money on using flower conditioning products in my operation, and then we give the giant jumbo packet um, that actually is for a quart of water with our flowers. And we don't do that because we just want to, we do it because it really makes a difference and it really, really works. So you'll find the fresh cut flower food and the CVB tablets um, in the supply category of our store at thegardenersworkshop.com. You'll find um, the seed collection. Um, in the seeds, there's actually a whole category of seed collections. Um, and if you order from us now, we still have our 2020 catalog um, that are being put in our orders as well as we still are giving out our pins to all of our orders. So you'll get a pin and a catalog when you order, as long as supplies last. And uh, we just appreciate so much all of y'all's support. Um, it's been really great for us um, to be able to keep all of our people working through the pandemic. And um, we just really, really appreciate it. So let's see what we're gonna do here now. Oh my goodness, now the bunnies are running and playing. This is really too comical, y'all. Um, the one thing I wanted to say, and then we're gonna get up and look at our little cutting garden and we're gonna do a little weeding. And you wanted to hear something really interesting about these rabbits. We have tons of rabbits. They have not, and I probably shouldn't say this, they have not touched this cutting garden. We have about 50% clover in our yard meaning there's grass and clover, and they just chow down on the clover constantly. They just don't mess with our flowers, um, and that's the secret of that. So I just wanna tell you this, and then we're gonna look. Um, we have some really exciting news that I haven't shared with anybody. We are introducing a, special, um, a specialty line of seeds, a custom um, line of seeds um, that are special mixes based on my experience of growing them and they are so amazing. I think we might have actually gotten the cover of our catalog photo today with two of the special mixes that'll be on the front of it, um, the flowers. So we are really excited about this. And you know, a lot of people are really surprised. My business coach is one of them. She can't believe that I'm still the person that cuts flowers on this farm. Of course, we're not in big production anymore. I basically cut twice a week. It's like a morning. I start at seven and I'm finished before lunch. But my best experiences to share with you all, my best ideas, 
I see problems, I see good stuff. Um, I think of some of the best stuff when I am out there cutting in the garden by myself. And I just can't tell you what a joy it really, really is. Um, our farm is really being transformed right now from a big production farm into more of a research and development farm. And we're bringing bulbs and perennials back. I'm, I'm going through Dave Dowling's course that registration just opens June 21st through the 26th for the bulbs, perennials, and woodies and more of growing them. And if you're an ambitious gardener, this is information you will not get anywhere else about maintenance, maintaining them, what you should grow, why, how you grow them, harvest them, take care of them. Um, and I've watched the course um, because we sell it, but I'm watching it. I'm going to be a student this time because we are really, really interested in bringing back diversity and bringing back more than just peonies. You know, we have peonies in our garden, but I don't really grow a lot of other um, shrubs, woodies, and perennials. So I'm really, really stoked about that. So I am going to get up from here and I want to show you guys, I'm going to take, I'm going to get, wait a minute, let's get you off this tripod. And um, so, turn you around. Of course the bunny, oh, there they are. There's one of the bunnies over there. He's thinking about having a little mint. All right, gang. Let's see what we have here. So, and see the sun's making a shadow. So, there's the inn, the famous building. That's the sweetest little potting shed. People actually lived in there, y'all. And um, those are the two three by five cutting gardens. They look pretty innocent right now, don't they? But let's walk up and take a look. So this side is the side that I actually ran the hoe through last week. And you can see it's in pretty good shape. And um, there's a few in there that I missed, but they're still small. But look over here. This is what that side would have looked like. Look at those weeds. Because I didn't really do this bed very thoroughly last week. So this is what's called our Japanese grass weeder. This is the right hand model because I'm a righty. And the way that you use this, see that blade? You use it with the blade flat on the ground. Um, and I'm just going to show you it's really easy to use. And see, for me, it's kind of hard because I'm trying to make sure you guys can see what I'm doing but not take out a plant. So, what happens is the blade is flat on the ground. I'm not scraping. See, see, I'm not doing like that. The blade is flat on the ground. And I am just sinking it down and pulling it through, cutting the roots on all of those little weeds. This is really hard to do, y'all, through the... And I don't have to pick those weeds up because they've been pretty much root has been really cut off and you can pick them out but when that's the joy of doing this so early when they're so young just the slightest disturbance often will just extinguish them you can see i weed eat it a little earlier and you can see there's a lot of grass laying in there so i would normally and see so you can go I could do this all day, y'all. And that's what happens to you when you kind of figure out just how simple and easy this is. You don't mind doing it. And you can kind of get People are coming up my driveway. Trying not to take the plant out. So look at all these little weeds. If you had to pull each one of those by hand, so let's see, I'm just trying to make sure I have a runway so I don't take somebody out. It's just really simple, y'all. 
I mean, it's really so nice that you'll find yourself coming back and saying, maybe I should go <laughs> check that again and do it again. And if any of these guys reattach, that's really okay because once a week, I try to do this. So like, how quick is this? And by just sliding this blade under the soil surface means you are not bringing a bunch, see look at all those little weeds. You are not bringing a bunch of new weed seeds to the surface. You don't wanna go deep, that's the whole point, right? Is you wanna just take out what's on the surface. So looky there. And I'm actually missing two zinnias. I forgot to replant them. I have some coming along inside I'll plug in. So this is our little garden. So you can see the rocks that are sitting on the cardboard. And then we filled this with um, the potting soil that was from pots that were sitting around the farm. Then we added more potting soil and about 50% potting soil 50 50 compost and um, then add the fertilizer and here we are so I'm feeling pretty good that we can probably mulch this week I think it's likely that the first thing I'll harvest out of these beds are the sunflowers perhaps um, the pro cut sunflowers are 55 to 60 days from seed to bloom that's why I love Pro Cut, y'all. I mean, look at these guys. They are just, I just can't, you just can't imagine how beautiful they are. They're just, and they last about 14 to 20 days in a vase when you cut them um, at the right stage, which means they're totally 100% protected from pests. Um, so they're just really, really, really beautiful. And so this is just starting to bloom. Somebody asked me about this the other day. This is, um, there's one bloom deep down in here. This is um, Heliopsis, it's a perennial. See them down there, whoops. Y'all, I'm sorry, I got too much stuff in my hands. And the leaves, there, I just plucked it off. This is, it looks like a Shasta daisy, but it's not, it's a Heliopsis. And it's a perennial, it's a super, I did start this from seed. We do not offer this seed, um, but I started this from seed years ago. And this is a perennial that blooms all summer long. Really, really beautiful. So I wanted to show you one more thing. See this, that's a block of um, concrete and I'm gonna take you around front. Let me put my, and I wanted to show you this. And see that one that says sunflower on it? This is a really fun project that you can do. These are over, remember that first garden I told you Suzanne and I did the gardens that we did like back in 2005? That is how long this has been sitting outside in my garden. So that is what's called puffy paint. You can get it at the craft store. Um, or Amazon, I'm sure, and you can paint on concrete or bricks or whatever, and it lasts forever. It's really a cute way to accent a garden, um, a really fun project for, um, for kids to actually do. Um, so let me just see if there's any questions I need to answer here. Hey, everybody. Good evening to everybody. Oh, Shelly, thank you for, she says she loves the sessions. Love tiny cutting gardens, that's how I learned. I mean, that's how I became a flower farmer, y'all. It's like, you just don't realize how productive. I'm telling you, the average person could never make use of larger than a three by 10, because this is what happens. Because it produces so many flowers and they last so long that what happens is they stop cutting it about midsummer, then it starts to dwindle because it's not being cut twice a week. And that's how often we recommend cutting is twice a week. And you know, it's just so productive and that's I um was really growing so much that I started selling. It's just kind of crazy. 
cute bunny hopping behind you. Yeah, that is pretty funny. Finally some sun after all the rain in Southern North Carolina. We have sun. I just um, watched today. We have like no rain until the end of the week. I'm gonna get a lot of work done this week. I direct seeded all my black sunflower bird seed. Oh, you mean they ate them? Should have row covered them. That's why I don't direct seed. That is just one of many reasons why I don't direct seed. It is nothing more disappointing than that. Um, oh, Jackie, I'm so sorry about the tree that fell on your house. I saw that on Facebook. I am so sorry. Oh, Shannon's having a risk of frost. Oh, you know that, um, what's the light doing? All right, y'all. We're going to walk over to where the tunnel kind of is because I'm going to show you the, um, we'll see what we can see over here. We had two nights of 38 degrees. The sun, see the sun is setting over there. Um, two nights of 38 degrees. And I also want to say if the internet goes out for just a second, just stand by. I'll be back because when I walk beside this building, when I, it goes from one power access thing, access point to another one. Um, we had two nights of 36 degrees, like two weeks ago or three weeks ago or something like that. And our beans got really snapped. I just figured, I saw, I just figured that out today. Sorry y'all, I'm going to turn and get you in another way so you can actually see something here. These beans, which are beautiful. Look at all those beans. They're all cold damaged. They got brown spots, not spots, brown edges. So hoping that's what it is. Anyway, so that's my squash. We keep our squash covered until it's too big to keep the squash bug off. This is um, buckwheat. This is um, the summer cover crop. This has been in for like 10 days. You can see how quickly it covers the soil. It's a great weed suppressor. Absolutely love this stuff. Um, if you go to buckwheat cover crop seeds on our store, there's a video showing how I plant this. It's really easy. Um, we just added a new size. It now comes in 10 pound bags also. But everybody should, anybody that gardens, home gardening, um, for sure. Anytime you have a bare spot in your garden that you're not immediately replanting, you plant buckwheat to do what it's doing right here. It's got this beautiful canopy. It's easy to turn under. Anyway, it tells you all that on the product. So we're walking down here to our, we just, we're just walking past my garden beds. This is like the garden we're planting on steroids, y'all. Like this whole bed is one color of zinnia. So here is, so there's the tunnel from the side. It's 32 feet long. It only has sunflower, um, sweet peas growing on it right now. And you can see them, it does a really good job. This is a permanent tunnel and it's really easy to put up. And if you go to on the gardenersworkshop.com, go to seeds or, or search gourd, go to the gourd seeds and it there's a video of us putting this up. Um, it is super easy and quick. Rhonda and I did it for, I mean, I think it took us like almost less than an hour. The sun's going the wrong way y'all. The inside of this tunnel is like 10, 12 inches deep in um, leaves, so we don't have to worry about weeds. And we've just planted, disregard those hoops. These are all cucumbers. And then we have gourds. And see, they'll just, let me just grab this little guy and lay him on in here. And then down here we have um, cantaloupes. These look pretty sad down here. You know, everything just waited to. It is really gonna be gorgeous. This is a really fun, this is old cover crop that's trying to grow in here. Y'all just disregard that. Um, but these are my sweet peas. These are cool flowers. These were planted last fall. The scent is, can y'all smell that? <laughs> this is high scent. This is my favorite sweet pea, by the way. 
strongest grower, most fragrant, very beautiful. Fall planting for most folks. So gang, there my internet's coming and going. So let's see what other questions we might have here. Oh, thank you, Jane. Hey, Mark. Hi, Ann. Jerry, we have people. So when did you say you planted these? I'm sure you're talking about the sunflowers. Um, we start planting our weekly sunflowers two weeks before our last frost date because we plant transplants and they were covered with hoops um, and protected. And we plant every week. When to harvest giant poppy pods and do you dry them? No, we, I'll walk down here, we'll see if the internet will stay with us. Um, we harvest them for fresh cuts and for seed. Y'all look at those little golden drumstick balls. It looks like a solar system, doesn't it? Maybe I'm just thinking that with with our, our dragon, SpaceX just landing. Um, so if you're harvesting them for fresh or for drying, you know, you don't want them to get really big like this because they'll burst. Um, can you hear that? Almost hear seeds in there. Um, look at that, y'all. 80 feet of poppy love. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So when I'm cutting them for bouquets, I like them like this. They're nice green color. They have no blemishes. I mean, this is just getting too big. I mean, this is just ridiculously big. You would never use that in a um, regular bouquet. So cut them young, younger than older as everything else. So gang, with all that, I'm just gonna sign off as I'm standing here. Wait a minute. Oh, Melissa, I did, I'll have to go back. Hello, Canada. Do you fertilize your cucumbers and melons? I did add dry fertilizer in the hole. You know, I mixed it in. So Jessica says, you don't find that cucumbers and gourds need to be protected from squash bugs? Yes. I police them with packing tape wrapped inside out on my hand and I look for eggs constantly and I'm constantly squishing and it worked last year and I probably shouldn't even say it that last year um, we didn't lose any of our vines I know exactly what you're talking about how do they stay so straight I'm not sure Rita what you're referring to um, so gang till we meet again next Sunday evening Please like and share this broadcast. That's what really helps me. Facebook shows it to more people. The more people that like it and share it. Um, so we really appreciate that. And that's what really makes me do more and more. Um, the poppies, they are in full blast in sun, Rita. That's why I've done nothing to them. Um, so if you like and share this, it really, really helps me. And to invite your friends, share it on your timeline and invite your friends to join us next Sunday evening at seven o'clock. Um, oh, Charlotte put up her tunnel today. And so we will see what the tunnel holds and what cool flowers will hold here as we're starting to heat up this year. So till we meet again, guys. Ciao.